The hottest new deck of the format is here. Tenpai Dragon is about to take over the meta, so in this video, I'm going to teach you how to beat it. What's Potion? You got Matt here, and welcome to another competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! video. Legacy of Destruction is finally here, and that means so is Tenpai Dragon. This amazing going second OTK Dragon deck is taking names in the OCG, topping multiple high-level events, and it's going to dominate in the TCG too. So if you want to play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! and you don't know how to beat Tenpai Dragon, then you're going to want to stick around, because in this video I'll show you the best cards to play against Tenpai Dragon, when to use those cards, the choke points and weaknesses of the deck, and even what decks are best suited to beat it. So if you're excited for the video and you've been enjoying our How to Beat series, then make sure to smash the like button. If this video hits 250 likes, I'll bring you the ultimate top tier Tenpai Dragon deck profile, and I'll give you options for budget players too. Also, if you like competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, including deck profiles, guys on how to beat the best decks, meta discussions, and videos just like this one, you're gonna love this channel, so make sure to subscribe. Also, leave a comment letting me know which deck you want me to cover next. But with that being said, here is the ultimate guide on how to beat Tenpai Dragon in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Let's jump into it. So what exactly is Tenpai Dragon? Well, it's a going second Fire Dragon deck that focuses very heavily on OTKing their opponents, and they do this because during the battle phase they have some of the strongest quick effects available in the game today. So if you're mashed up against someone at a local, a regional, a YCS, they win the die roll and say, no, no you go first, then you can be pretty confident you're playing against Tenpai Dragon. The deck really wants to go second because it tries to OTK and there's no battle phase in the first turn of the game, but the reason why they're so comfortable doing this is because of their field spell, Sangen Summoning. This card gives all the Fire Dragon monsters they control protection from your activated effects during their main phase 1 only, which is incredibly powerful. To support its going second strategy, Tenpai Dragon is easily able to play a ton of non-engine. And this is where the first question comes up. Are you playing against a more heavy hand trap version of Tenpai Dragon, which has a lot of hand traps, about 20 or so in the main deck that allow it to also go first? Or are you playing against a more heavy board breaker version of Tenpai Dragon that plays a ton of board breakers to make it so that they don't care what board you set up and they can OTK through that in an instance. Don't be surprised if you see pure Tenpai Dragon lists with like 20 different non-engine spots, the deck just can do it so easily. Here's a pretty basic Tenpai Dragon deck with hand traps, and here's a pretty basic one with board breakers instead. But the problem is, which version is better? The OCG plays more board breakers, but they also have max C in their formats. The board breaker version of Tenpai Dragon is also much weaker when going first, but a common play for any Tenpai Dragon deck when going first is going to be Spheres pass with hand traps. If they play a fewer hand trap lineup, then by nature they'll see few of them, making them more susceptible to being OTK'd. When looking at the Tenpai decks I've shown you so far, there are a few trends that are going to stick out. You're almost always going to see these ratios. Three copies each of Sangen Summoning, Sangen Kaiman, Tenpai Dragon Pedra, and Tenpai Dragon Chandra. Two copies of Tenpai Dragon Fadra, and one Terraforming. The rest of the list is pretty open for interpretation. Pot of Prosperity is very common, so are Bistul's Magnemut and Druid's Worm, and most Tenpai lists are playing Forbidden Droplet as it's one of the best going first and second interruptions. But other than that, there are so many options to use. So usually in this series I talk about the end board of a specific deck so you know what you're going to be going up against if they have their main combo online. But for Tenpai Dragon it's a little bit tricky to do that, and the reason why is because they don't want to go first. Their main first turn combo is going to be Spheres Pass, which is still very scary for this deck and I'll explain why right now. So starting with a copy of Pydra, you're going to go ahead and normal summon this card and use the effect to add Kaiman from deck to hand. If they decide to Droll and Lockbird you here, you can chain the effect of Kaiman to add to hand your copy of Chandra and then let Droll resolve. You're going to use the effect of Chandra to special summon itself because you control a Fire Dragon monster. Then you're going to perform a Link Summon with these two into your copy of Hieratic Seal of the Heavenly Spears. Now you can just go ahead and pass the turn, and then on your opponent's turn, if it's in the battle phase or the main phase, whatever it might be, you're going to use the effect of Spears, tributing itself or cost to non-target bounce a card from the field to the hand. Then you're going to use its second effect in the graveyard to be able to special summon any dragon from your deck and make its attack and defense zero. In this case here, we can summon out our copy of Fadra, and then we're going to go ahead and use the effect of Fadra on summon to target and summon back our copy of Chandra. So once again, we have a tuner and a non-tuner. We can then go ahead and use these two, synchro summon them off into our copy of Black Rose Dragon, and we can use Black Rose Dragon's effect and destroy everything on the field. 
As for going second, there are a ton of lines out there, but the most common one you're going to see is the 30,000 damage one, which can be accomplished with the field spell and any discard. I've gone over this combo a few times already, but here's the gist of it. You're going to start by activating the field spell and use the effect to add Pydra from deck to hand and then discard a blank card. You're going to normal summon Pydra and on summon use the effect to add Kaiman from deck to hand. You're going to go to battle phase and activate Kaiman here to add and summon Chandra from your deck. You're then going to go and attack with your copy of Pydra and trigger the effect in damage step of Chandra to summon out Fadra from the deck as well. Because this was done in the damage step, it can't be negated with something like Ash Blossom. You're then going to attack with Chandra and use the effect of Pydra here to synchro summon with the Chandra into your copy of Bident Dragon here. On summon, you're going to use Bident Dragon to summon out the copy of Chandra once again, and then you're going to go ahead and attack with the Bident Dragon. And again, in damage step, you're going to use Fadra here to summon out Pydra from the graveyard. You're then going to attack with the rest of your monsters and then use the effect here of Fadra to synchro with the Abidant Dragon into your copy of Transcend Dragon. Transcend Dragon will be able to attack. You can also use Biden Dragon to summon itself back and then you can go and synchro summon with the Pydra and the copy of Biden Dragon into your copy of Trident Dragon. On summon, use Trident Dragon's effect, destroying the Chandra and the Sangin summoning to be able to give it two extra attacks, and then use Sangin Summoning, targeting the Trident Dragon to boost his attack to 6,000. So now you can attack three times, 6,000 each, 18,000 damage. If you really want to as well, instead of destroying the copy of the Chandra, you can destroy the Transcend Dragon and then bring it back as well with its own effect. But keep in mind that effect is once per duel. There are so many more combos the deck can produce. And if you want to see them, you got to make sure to subscribe because we're officially in Tenpai Dragon Week, where all week I'll be bringing you amazing Tenpai Dragon videos. And by the end of it, you'll know how to beat and play Tenpai Dragon. But now that you know what the deck looks like and what the game plan actually is, let's take a look at some more specific cards that'll help you beat this strategy, starting off with Hand Traps. And these are the ones we're going to be covering today. So with Ash Blossom, there are really only three places to use it. Either you use it on the Pedra, assuming summoning isn't on the field. You can use it on summoning to search, but if they have a Tenpai already in hand, it doesn't really matter. And you can use it on Kaimen in the battle phase so they can't search and special summon, which is usually going to be the best case. Remember, you can't use Ash on the effect of Chandra if they declare it in the damage step, because Ash Blossom negates effects and not activations. As for when you're going second, using Ash on the effect of Spears to summon from the deck also feels pretty good. And I know people are worried about their opponents summoning back their copy of Ash Blossom with Hita, but Ash is just too good of a card to not play in this format, in my opinion. Droll is not strong against Tenpai Dragon. There are obvious exceptions, but they don't come up too often. For example, if they start with Pot of Prosperity, then yeah, it's awesome, because Pedra, Summoning, and Kaiman all search. But if they already have Pedra and Chandra in hand, then they can just OTK through Droll and Lockbird. I'd recommend not playing Droll in this matchup. As for Infinite Impermanence and Effect Valor, these two cards are very different from each other. First off, Valor is awful in this matchup. It can only be used during your opponent's main phase, and if they have Sangen summoning, then it can only be used during their main phase too. So no, don't play Valor against them. But Infinite Impermanence is much better than Valor. You can use it during the battle phase on the effects to quick synchro, but it's not always an easy call. Let's go back to the combo I showed you for 30,000 damage and let me know when's the right time to imperm. You can't imperm red at the start of the battle phase because they can just quick synchro with white for Biden Dragon and summon back the red and do everything all over again. You can't imperm on declaration of red in the damage step because imperm doesn't negate activation and therefore can't be used in damage step. Do you think you should use it in response to the effect to quick synchro? Well, you can't because all tempies share this effect so another one will use it and they're all soft ones per turns. You can't use it on green because most of the time they activate the effect in damage step but if they don't, then it's a pretty good target. If you try to Imperm Biden Dragon, they can simply quick synchro with it to dodge the effect of Imperm to go into Transcend Dragon, and then it's too late, because you can't activate cards or effects in the battle phase. So unless they don't use the effects in damage step or are forced to use the effect of green on summon, there isn't a single clean use of infinite impermanence. But if you have two copies of Imperm, it's fantastic, because most simple lines can't play through two copies of Imperm. I'd still recommend playing it, but it's not an amazing card in this matchup. Moving on to Nibiru. Nib is bad in this matchup, like really bad. They never really summon in the main phase, and if they do, it's in main phase 2 or for very specific matchups like Runic, for example. 
It's a better card now than it was when Barone and Savage Dragon were legal, but not in this matchup. Fantastical Dragon Phantasme is another card that's also pretty bad here. Yes, they link summon, but not always, and there are just going to be more impactful cards. As for Skullmeister, it negates effects and not activations, so it can't be used in the damage step. Dimension Shifter seems like it would be amazing because there's a lot of summoning from the graveyard, but then you remember that Tenpai plays Shifter too. They can easily OTK through Shifter, but they don't love to do so. So if you're playing something like Flu or Kashtira, which already play Shifter naturally, I don't actually hate keeping it in for games 2 and 3. The Bistrals are also very weak in this matchup because all the Tenpais are fire monsters and the deck doesn't really give you a light or dark to work with. On the other hand, DD Crow is better, but not by a ton. It can't be used in the damage step, but they do target with Fadra and Bidens, which is a nice way to slow them down, but they can usually still get over 8,000 damage. Ghost Bell is actually really solid. It's one of the few cards that can actually be used in the damage step because it negates activations, so you can use it in response to Fadra's effect to summon from the graveyard. The problem is that it's not super impactful, but if you have a bunch of useless hand traps in your main deck, you can do a lot worse than Ghost Bell. But Ghost Ogre. Ghost Ogre is very strong. It doesn't target, and it can deal with multiple cards they might have. It's great against the field spell, it's great against the effects to quick synchro in the battle phase because it destroys the monster using the effect to synchro, so it resolves without effect. It's also not the worst against other decks, so it might be a card to consider siding in this format. Hand traps are very important against Tenpai Dragon, since most of the cards you would be setting phase down are being destroyed by the effects of Harpy's Feather Duster or Lightning Storm which are super common in Tenpai Dragon. But that being said, board breakers do have a role as well and these are the ones we're going to be covering today. Evenly matched is bad against Tenpai Dragon. There is no ifs and or buts about it. You can't activate cards or effects once they get to level 10 on the field, and if they don't have it, they can always just quick synchro to reduce the resources they would lose. Oh, and it's also very likely that they just OTK you before you can even use it. Dark Ruler No More is also a terrible idea against Tenpai Dragon. The end board they produce isn't weak to it at all, so please just don't use this card against Tenpai. As for cards like Kaiju, Lava Golem, and Spear Mode, if you use these cards, it's because you're going second, meaning they go first, and their first turn play is Spheres Pass, which if you tribute it, it summons from the deck, so no. Kaijus don't really help, and Sphere Mode and Lava Golem are also terrible. Change of Heart, as far as board breakers go, is actually better than the cards I've mentioned so far, but not by much. Triple Tactic Talents is similar to Change of Heart, but it's a much better card when you're going first, because you can usually see their hands and find out what they actually have to try and OTK you. Kashtira Fenrir is also really solid, because you can use it to get rid of the Feel Spell after they use the effect of Pydra, which means no attack doubling. Its effect also works in the battle phase. Of all the cards I've mentioned in the board breaker section, this one is the best, but even then it's not amazing. As for Raigeki, Dark Hole, Lightning Storm, and Harpy's Feather Duster, these board wipes are bad with the exception of Duster and Lightning Storm because if they go first, it's possible they set a few cards like Forbidden Droplet or Super Polymerization. But again, I'd prefer to use other cards. Like Cosmic Cyclone, which really only has one real target, the Field Spell, but I actually think that because of how good it is against a lot of field spells in the format today, it actually has some viability in the main deck of all places. Now there are definitely some cards that I missed talking about in that previous section, but don't worry, I'm going to cover them here now. The cards we're going to talk about, I'm going to split between cards that are good going first and cards that are good going second. Starting off with cards that are good going first. Dimensional Barrier is a top tier card against this deck. It turns off their ability to Synchro Summon, which you usually want to save for the battle phase if you can, but if they threaten it with something like Cosmic Cyclone, just go ahead and use it anyways. They can still OTK through Dimensional Barrier if they play the Salmon Great Raging Phoenix line, but it's not very common to see and it's also pretty weak to Interruption. Forbidden Droplet and Super Polymerization. These two cards are good board breakers that are just better off going first into Tenpai Dragon because they can't respond to the effects of these cards and they can shut off possible synchros. Leerlisk Assembled Nightingale is a great rank 1 for this strategy. Basically, it means that you'll never get OTK'd by Tenpai Dragon. Simply detach a material from this card and you won't take battle damage this turn. There are exactly 3 outs that Tenpai Dragon has to this card. If you decide to shotgun the effect, they can just imperm in response, or you can wait until they commit a card to the field but then it loses to a kaiju or santa claus, or they can wait for you to activate the effect and then use their own copy of forbidden droplet to negate it. 
As for going second, Super Polymerization and Forbidden Droplet are also really good going second. Once the Tempai Dragon player gets two monsters on the field to try and Black Rose or Synchro or whatever they try and do, you can shut them down. But other than that, it's about using your engine very well. If you can put up a monster negate or disruption, you should be able to OTK or stop them from accessing anything really scary on your turn. Just be careful because Heatwave is a very common card for them to play. As for some choke points and weaknesses for the strategy, the first one I wanted to bring up is the Field Spell. The Field Spell is insane for Tenpai Dragon for a few reasons. The first of which is going to be obviously the protection effect that it offers. The fact that they can just really do all their plays during main phase 1 because all their fire dragons are immune to the activated effects of your cards is really strong. But the field spell also gives them consistency, so if you can Ghost Ogre or Cosmic Cyclone or get rid of the field spell to stop it from resolving that first effect, you're going to be in a really good position. The next card I wanted to talk about is actually Transcend Dragon, not because it's a choke point or a weakness, but more so because it's the type of card that once it hits the field, there's no coming back from and you're probably going to lose the duel. Because you can't activate cards or effects in the battle phase, there's nothing you can really do to stop them from OTKing you, which is very problematic. So you really have to try and stop them from even getting to this point in the first place. And the last weakness I wanted to talk about is actually going first. The deck itself really wants to go second, like more so than any deck probably in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. This deck itself, if you can force it to go first, their end board is significantly weaker than it would be if they can go second. So if you have good engine, good plays, good siding patterns, you should have a really good shot against beating Tenpai Dragon if you can force them to go first. Now let's talk about some decks that have a good matchup against Tenpai Dragon, starting off with Yubel. Yubel has a really good matchup against Tenpai Dragon because all their monsters can't be destroyed by battle and you also take no battle damage from attacks involving those monsters, which means that they can't actually do damage to the Yubel player, which is really important. But to get around this, Tenpai Dragon players are playing two cards, the first of which being Samurai Destroyer, and the second one being Time Lord Progenitor Vorpgate. These two cards allow them to deal with Yubel in a much easier fashion. Runic decks also have a better matchup against Tenpai Dragon than many other strategies, and part of the reason why is because they can keep a lot of their resources in their hand. They can also protect the Fountain from being destroyed thanks to Hugin's effect, which means cards like Harpy's Feather Duster are really not that problematic. But if they can resolve the effects of Freezing Curses and Flashing Fire to negate cards and destroy cards, they're going to have a really good time at stopping the OTK. But on top of that, just having access to Slepnir alone helps stop the OTK as well, which is really important because it also stops the Quick Synchros because you can use it in response to the effect of a Quick Synchro. But to get around this, Tenpai Dragon players are starting to incorporate Secret Village of the Spellcasters to be able to stop them from using the effects of their spell cards. They would use this in tandem with a Charmer for example, or with Nirvana High Paladin which they can make with Shooting Riser Dragon and Ancient Fairy Dragon. As far as decks with an average matchup, I wanted to highlight the Snake Eye decks, and the reason why is because these decks have such amazing recovery that even if they are hit with multiple board breakers, they can still usually create enough bodies to survive the OTK. And when they're going first, if that all fails, they can always use the level 1 monsters to make Lyralisk Assembled Nightingale to make sure they have a way to not die on that turn. As for a deck with a bad matchup against Tenpai Dragon, I wanted to talk about Labyrinth. Labyrinth has a really hard time with Tenpai Dragon because a lot of the time Lab has to commit their resources to the field and they also really want to go first. There are some going second versions of that but they're not always going to find success. Because Lab commits their resources to the field, they're really weak to cards like Harpy's Feather Duster, of course causing Cyclone, Lightning Storm, just general back row removal. And once the back row is gone, Tenpai Dragon is free to swing in for an OTK. Overall, Tenpai Dragon is going to be one of the best decks of the format. The deck itself is really powerful, has a very high ceiling, and is hard to counter. But keep this in mind, a lot of players, even if they're not playing Tenpai Dragon, will have it in their side deck, and the reason why is when they know they're going to be going second, they can side in this package and OTK very easily. And there you have it, you now have a guide on how to beat Tenpai Dragon in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! But let me know down in the comments below, how are you planning to beat Tenpai Dragon and what decks are you playing this format? If you made it this far in the video, you must have enjoyed it, so make sure to smash the like button and of course subscribe for more amazing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. Check out my sponsor, Imperium Duelist, and use code OSHEA10, O-S-H-E-A-10 for 10% off your purchase and to support the channel as well. And follow me on Twitter and join the Discord server, both of which are linked in the description. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.